And I put my whole narratussy into it. So I really hope. <laughs> Ladies, gentlemen, and those with the good sense to do away with the whole notion, I welcome you to the premier audio medium for all your Fazbear entertainment needs. The Freddy Fazbear Pizza Podcast. Note, FFPP is not responsible for any loss of appetite, disinterest, dismemberment, or other legally classified statuses. So strap in and enjoy. Hello and welcome back to the Freddy Fazbear Pizza Podcast. I'm your host with the toast, Right Toast here, with a confusing temporal podcast. Uh, what I mean by that is, if if you haven't been following the channel, um, I am on vacation this week. I left uh, as of recording today, the 27th, but a few days ago for you guys, and I'll be back Friday night. So like and like late, late, pretty much Saturday morning. Um, so I'm kind of missing the first two days of FNAF week, which sucks, but I'll be able to start streaming this weekend and I'll be very excited. I think our first stream is either going to be Saturday or if we didn't recover that well post-vacation Sunday, um, and we'll be reading VIP on stream. Uh, really excited for that, by the way. And I guess speaking of books, I teased it. Um, oh, shoot. I didn't announce the third channel in Friday's video, which comes out like three days before. Okay, so I have to record that later Pfft, oops um but yeah uh, this this video should be coming out on the 30th um it, almost a week from now and i'll announce this again on friday's video i'm gonna have to insert a little thing there um i'm launching my third channel because i'm a psychopath this one i've teased it a bunch of times but I'm officially announcing it right here. I don't know if I said the name. Did I do this on the podcast already? I don't remember. It's Rye Doze. R-Y-E-D-O-Z-E. -E. I'll put the link in the description because it's kind of hard to find since there's no videos on it. The first video, uh, the, the point of this channel, I've explained it before, I think, on the podcast. I, I, I can't remember because I've been recording these out of order. Um, but it's essentially... A YouTube channel for like slower longer videos so compilations of main channel videos read through audiobooks of short stories I, I've definitely explained this channel before um probably a podcast with me and my wife and maybe, maybe we're thinking of maybe doing like an advice podcast um not just relationship advice but you know one of those like I'll pull up a couple reddit stories uh, looking for advice, and we'll give our takes on it. We're thinking maybe something like that. And maybe long plays of video games. I'm not sure. But that's the point of this channel. But the first video, August 5th, will be uh, an audiobook reading of Into the Pit. Uh, I figured that would be my way to contribute to FNAF Week, especially four days before, or like, I guess math-wise, three days, but four days it's on Monday to Thursday, before the Into the Pit game comes out. So that way, if you want to know the story and you don't yet, and the game is coming out, th this is an easy way to, I think it's an hour and a half long, just to listen and get the whole story. And I put my whole narratussy into it, so I really hope... <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, that... Is that the cold open? Maybe? That might be the cold open. But... <laughs> um. I really, I think it'd be good. I think it's good practice for me. And I think I did a good job, especially for the first time ever doing something like that. So I hope you guys will enjoy that. Um, but again, the link to the channel is in the description. And I'll, I think I'll, I'll have to record and promote it on the main ch channel video uh, on Friday because I haven't done that yet. And no, <laughs> it's really hard to find right now. Um, but what more to the point, temporally, this is a bit of a weird episode. Because for those of you who have been like following along, I have been very sick for the past like five days. Today I feel really good. You can still hear that I'm congested, but my, like my throat doesn't hurt. Um, it's easy to talk. I don't feel super congested and I have no other symptoms. It's just kind of like the back half of this sickness. Um, 
But like, I couldn't speak Tuesday or Wednesday. I just did not have a voice, which was wild. Um, Monday, I recorded the podcast for this week with the last of my voice. Um, or this past week with the last of my voice. And I know y'all heard it. I talked about it. Like my voice was dying. Some of y'all liked the deep voice. Uh, I'm sick ASMR voice. Some of y'all like that a little too much. I saw your comments. I am married. Thank you very much. Back off. No, <laughs> but, um, but this week's main channel video that came out yesterday that I'm really happy with the Golden Freddy video that I, people seem to be really receptive to. Thank you so much. Um, but that video I recorded before I was sick, like the day before I really got sick. So I sound fine in that video. This podcast coming out after I'm still getting over the sickness. Friday's video next week, I recorded yesterday. I was more sick. So if you don't follow these podcasts or the streams and like know what's going on, essentially the release order is about to lose my voice sick perfectly fine just got my voice back sick or like just got over being sick voice and just got my voice back sick they're like so out of order recording wise but i i did what i had to uh because not only was i sick this week that i'm recording but the week this comes out i'm on vacation so i couldn't record it like two days from now i'm not gonna be home uh, same with the main channel video. So it's just been such a weird two weeks. Um, but I appreciate y'all hanging out for the ride. That's explaining the weird timing of everything. But most importantly, we've got news to talk about. I would have made a main channel video on this topic, but uh, it happened last night and I cannot make a video that quickly. Um, so <laughs> it's just going to be delegated to a podcast, which is fine. I like making these, uh, and some of y'all like listening to them. We got an announcement for the third interactive novel. Now, some of you might realize this is technically the fourth that's being released, but VIP, the shorter free one coming out a week from the date of recording on the third, um, that is technically number zero in the series. Jesus Christ. I'm leaving that in. For anyone who doesn't know, I record under the kitchen and someone just dropped like two glass spice bottles and it scared the shit out of me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so VIP is number zero in the series. Number one coming out in September is the week before. This is the one set the week before FNAF 1. Um, number two in the series, Return to the Pit, is pretty obviously Into the Pit, coming out in December. And we just got an announcement and a description for March. I believe it's a March release next year. So this is like like six months away. The, more than six months away. This is a long time. Like maybe eight months. I, I don't know the quick math on that. It's like, what, five plus three. So yeah, eight months away. But it's called Escape the Pizza Plex. And yeah, that's a big old title. So VIP is like set, probably set before Security Breach. But I'm like, okay, is that our Security Breach book? Because we're getting a FNAF 1 book and Into the Pit book. Is that our Security Breach book? Nope. This is our Security Breach book. Let me just read the description. Relive the newest, biggest Five Nights at Freddy's location and setting of the Smash Security Breach game in this all new interactive novel. You are Cassie, a young girl trapped inside Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizza Plex, chased by terrifying animatronics as well as the night guards. You've got to do whatever you can to make it out alive. Can you escape, or will it be game over before dawn? This is interesting for several reasons. For like uh, the rest of this topic is just going to be talking about the repercussions of this book. Now, again, not only is this book not out, none of the interactive novels are out. So we have to speculate heavily here, but we have a pretty meaty description to chew on. So let's go over this. First of all, timeline placement, because and I'll get into it later. For now, I'm assuming all of these books are within the game continuity. We have no reason to assume otherwise. I mean, they're not even out yet, but all the descriptions are pretty like, 
holding your hand like this is set within this video game, this specific video game. I'm like, okay, damn. Um, if this is within the game's continuity, this book has got to be pre-security breach. There's a little bit of ambiguity with VIP, but I think this book pretty handedly has to be pre-security breach. May and yes, sure, the pizza plex is operable and in a functioning state, which like that means it's probably before security breach. But there are like two or three endings where you can still be at the pizza plex after security breach. But the main point here is it says, as well as the night guards, plural, there is more than one night guard at this pizza plex because they are separated from animatronics. I feel like that means these are human night guards. Now, they might be staff bots, but if they are human night guards and there's multiple, then this has to be pre-security breach. Because as of security breach, there's one human working at the Pizzaplex, that being Vanessa. She's already done the all-staff meeting. All of the other human employees have either been fired or possibly killed. So since as of security breach, there is one night guard, the fact that this description specifies plural night guards means this has to be pre-security breach as long as those night guards are not staff bots. And that also brings some interesting questions. So we know we're most likely definitely before security breach. This might be giving us more of a backstory on Cassie because we do know a surprising amount of Cassie for a FNAF protagonist. Usually these are like, empty slates of lore but we actually have a good bit of information on cassie for one we know she loves the fnaf animatronics at least the pizzaplex ones she cares deeply about them and wants to help them we also know that she had a terrible birthday party that nobody showed up at except for gregory so we and we know that she loved being at the daycare and like her father probably worked at the pizzaplex since he had a faz wrench just like the one she uses. So like we know a good amount about Cassie, but then immediately things seem strange here. If Cassie loves these animatronics, why would she still love them as of ruin if in this book she'd been hunted down by animatronics? Surely as a kid, if I'm being chased and hunted and attacked by animatronics, I'm not going to turn around and love them and like want to be around them. What's the issue here? Immediately, some people said like, okay, this is evidence these books are not in continuity because if Cassie was hunted by these animatronics, why would she like them? Like, like I said, even the daycare, even when the Security Beach Pizzaplex was functioning properly and, ki and like people were going there every day, kids were reported having horrible nightmares and permanently bedwetting when they went to the daycare because of what Moon was doing, presumably being creepy and maybe kidnapping some children. So why is it that this was going on and Cassie still loved this place in spite of it all? And also she was hunted. I don't think it's an inconsistency on the face of it. I don't think this is evidence that these books are outside of the game's continuity. And let me explain why. Like I said, None of the books are released yet. We don't know the contents of these books. But going off of their descriptions and going off the type of book it is, I think it is safe to assume they are in continuity. After all, like I mentioned, each book is directly tied to a specific game to the point where most of their descriptions say this is set within this game. That's very cut and dry. That is hard to argue against. Not only that, all of these books have multiple endings and multiple plots within them. And the full versions of these books have 25 plus endings. So like, this is the perfect book for Scott to unabashedly be like, this is a in continuity fully within the timeline book. Because only one of these endings is canon. So like that, that makes so much sense for FNAF as a franchise to be like, oh yeah, one of these 25 endings happened. Good luck figuring it out. Like, that makes total sense. So what about this book? Because if all of them so far are within continuity, I think it's safe to assume the whole series will be. But then this book presents that weird, that weird difference with Cassie. Like, why does she care about these animatronics if they've hunted her down? On the surface, going into this, I don't see an issue. The only time we see Cassie willingly enter 
a pizza plex, our pizza plex, in game is in ruin. And think about the context of ruin. This pizza plex has been closed for a long time, is dilapidated and mostly destroyed, and nobody works there anymore. And she's only going inside of it to help Gregory. This does not conflict with the book. If the book says Cassie has been hunted down by animatronics and workers at the place, and then the next time we see her going in is ruin, there is no contradiction, right? I don't, I see a child being like, this place is terrifying. This place scared me. This place almost killed me. My best friend said he needed help. He's at the old dilapidated pizza plex that is not in operation. Nobody's working there and the animatronics are probably shut off. I think I can go in and I can help him. There's no contradiction there. The contradiction does come in, however, when going through Cassie's backstory. We know that she loved going to the pizza plex and we know that she currently loves these animatronics even if she's worried about them hurting her. So what is going on here? The way I look at this, and again, none of the books are out. We are fully speculating here. But if I had to like make a guess as to how this makes sense within a timeline, Escape the Pizza Plex is probably the last time Cassie went into the Security Breach Pizza Plex until Ruin. That was what began this gap. If I'm like on the surface looking at this book, I see Cassie loving the pizza plex and the animatronics within it. She would go to the daycare, hang out with Moon and Sun. She would hang out with Roxy. She loves Roxy. She had her birthday party there. And then, you know, maybe her birthday party is the catalyst of this. If we're going pre-security breach, right, Gregory is likely still under the control of Glitch Trap. And if that's true... Gregory helping Cassie and making her birthday even better may have all been a setup. All right, I'm going full conspiracy. I was going to stick. Uh, I'm going full conspiracy. Hear me out. Plot of Escape the Pizza Plex. It begins on Cassie's birthday. It goes horribly wrong. None of her friends show up. This is on purpose. GGY or Gregory slash Dr. Rabbit. We know this little devil will kill he has killed and he will kill again not personally but he'll sick the animatronics on you essentially so if glitch trap needs children for some reason i'm assuming remnant but like here's the thing we don't really know how they're planning to bring william afton back but we know that there's at least 12 missing people as of security breach so people are being killed and hidden probably for a purpose if we are trying to get Remnant and Gregory sees that one of his classmates, who's already kind of shy or whatever, is having a birthday party, this is a perfect opportunity. If Cassie's trying to have her birthday party at the Pizza Plex, all Gregory needs to do is change the date for the outgoing invites. Change the date, make it so all of her friends miss it. And now Cassie shows up to her birthday party, ready to go, ready to have fun, and nobody else arrives. Now, Gregory, again, this isn't Gregory. This is Glitchtrap puppeting Gregory. Now, Glitchtrap, as Gregory, has the perfect opportunity to manipulate Cassie to be a victim. Cassie is all alone on her birthday party. This is the worst day of her life. And suddenly, a boy she doesn't even know walks up and offers her a napkin. Now, Cassie and Gregory are friends, and Glitchtrap can use that to get Cassie down into the basement and eventually, hopefully, probably, I guess, die and extract her remnant. I'm not, again, we're not sure why all these people keep going missing, but they're clearly being used for something. So I think Escape the Pizza Plex starts with Cassie's birthday party going well now because she's hanging out with Gregory and the other animatronics and then glitch trap as Gregory convinces her to go even further down hey there's a secret cool place I think you want to see she goes there now 
the book starts having consequences. Now it's past midnight, Gregory's gone, and it's just hostile animatronics and human guards looking for her, and she has to make it out alive. Now I hear you. If this all happens, and Cassie's been hunted down by these animatronics and these guards, and even betrayed by Gregory, why is she so willing to love, accept, and heal the animatronics, and why she's still such good friends with Gregory that she'd risk her life going back down to the pizzaplex to save him? My guess, more manipulation. We see in GGY, Glitchtrap as Gregory is a master of manipulation. Very, like, to the point where he messes up the project and now his his friend he was working on it with hates him for it, so mad at him about it. And even still, with the way Glitchtrap is able to manipulate people, is like, hey, I'm sorry, let me make it up to you. I've got these passes for the Pizzaplex. Let's go, let's go play. And that works, and the kid presumably dies. So, but so the question now is, if this all happens, why is Cassie still friends with Gregory? Why does she still like the animatronics? I think there is a turning point. I think once Cassie successfully escapes the Pizzaplex, Glitchtrap gives up on her. Too much to handle, not worth it. I'll find a less capable child. I'm sure there's plenty. We have no reason to believe this. But Vanessa is not a perfect copy. Vanessa is not a perfect victim. Vanny and Vanessa can swap back and forth. Gregory may be the same way, but even if he isn't, post-security breach, he is Gregory again. So there is time here for Gregory and Cassie to make up, even if it's post-security breach. The idea of like, hey, what happened, Gregory? I'm not sure but I was, I was not, I don't know what happened. And now Cassie gets to be like, yeah, I was hunted down by animatronics. And Gregory's like, you too? And in their trauma, friends, right? I feel like that's pretty, that's understandable, especially for that age group to be like, if Cassie's like, what happened? I got hunted down by animatronics and you disappeared. Gregory goes, I don't know what happened, but I was hunted by animatronics. Friends. I think that makes sense. Even more so if Gregory has partial control. In GGY, he doesn't seem to. But if Gregory has partial control over the GGY personality, then like the, the next day it could be like, hey, what happened to you? I don't know. I lost you. Where'd you go? You know, and then friends again. The animatronics have a different idea. We are pretty certain that Cassie's dad works at the Pizzaplex. And we know Cassie's dad is a huge fan of, of Fazbear. I assumed like... At the jump, Cassie's dad is working at the Pizzaplex to make sure it's a nice, safe place for his daughter and she can play there all day. I think that's still true. But I think Escape the Pizzaplex might also be the inciting incident for Cassie's dad to become the Help Wanted 2 protagonist. Picture this. You are Cassie's dad, who I think is Jeremy Fitzgerald. You are Cassie's dad. And you get your dream job of being a Faz technician at the brand new Mega Pizzaplex, the pinnacle of your favorite franchise. And as a bonus, working there, your daughter can stay at the daycare for free. So now you can do your job and your daughter can party. And then you both go home. That sounds like a sweet gig. And then one day, your daughter describes the worst thing you've ever heard. Her birthday party was a wreck and none of her friends who up until now you thought were good kids showed up and not only that when you went to look for her you couldn't find her and you find out it's because she was hunted down by the very place you take care of now she's terrified she doesn't want to go back are you kidding me the last time she was there she almost died what happened now Cassie stays home and you as her father, you work here. You can find out what happened. And maybe you can fix it to make it the place she knew and loved. She still loves these characters, just like the crying child who, terrified of the animatronics, loved the characters. If you can find out what went wrong here, maybe you can fix that issue too. So you go back to work. You look into the system. What, what happened with the birthday party? Wait, 
all these dates have been changed, someone's tampering here. You look into the animatronics, you examine their code, there's G's and Y's everywhere. In GGY, some random teenager is able to find out that the code has been malfunctioned with. Surely a fast technician knowing something is wrong, not malfunctioned with, I'm sorry, brain fart. A random teenager is able to find out that the coding of the animatronics had been tampered with, and whoever tampered it left a signature of G's and Y's throughout the code. If you're a fast technician hired at this place and you have incentive to look, surely you would find the same thing. This begins Cassie's dad's rabbit hole spiral into the madness of what's going on here until eventually Help Wanted 2 happens and he gets too deep, too vulnerable, and Vanny and Glitchtrap take him out. I think Escape the Pizzaplex will not only give us the answers as to how we get to ruin, but what's going on before Security Breach and how we get to Help Wanted 2. I think this book is going to give us the answers that we've been assuming, but give us more evidence to say, hey, this is what's happening for Help Wanted 2, and this is where how we got to ruin. So how does this gain Cassie's trust back in the animatronics? I don't think it does, but I think it does open the door. I'm sure Cassie's dad is somewhat open with her. Like we know, Cassie's dad refused to tell her what happened to Bonnie. If you are, as a father, already are sensitive that your daughter had a traumatic experience with these animatronics, and you say like, oh yeah, Glamrock Bonnie's out of commission, and she's like, why? The last thing you would say is, oh, one of the animatronics killed him, destroyed him. No, you would never. You would be sensitive to that. But you would not be so secretive that she can't trust you. And again, I'm, I'm placing a lot of characterization and speculation on someone we know nothing about. This is frankly edging into fan fiction, but just stick with me. If you're Cassie's dad trying to fix this issue and you want her to be comfortable at this pizza plex, I think the best course of action here is to be open, but cherishable. Yeah, something went wrong. I want to fix these animatronics so you can hang out with your friends again. These characters you love, these animatronics you love, I want to make them safe for you again. Then when we get to Ruin, I think her attitude makes sense. She is immediately apprehensive of these animatronics, even though she loves these characters. When Chica first appears, sure it's a jump scare, sure she's scared, and she's scared for a moment. And she's not like, oh, this doesn't make sense. It's, Chica, what happened to you? She knows something is wrong here, and now she's seeing the result of it. I think... Not only does Escape the Pizzaplex not contradict what we see in game, I think it's going to give us a lot of explanation and evidence for things that we had a good sense about, but now we have more confirmation of. So I'm really excited for this book. Again, it comes out in like eight months, but I think it's going to be super helpful. Kind of a shorter topic, but again, it's one book description. I don't know how long I can talk about that for. Um, but we're going to move on to questions. If you want your questions answered on the podcast, feel free to send them to freddyfazbearpizzapodcast at gmail.com. Uh, that's in the description to copy and paste because I know it's a pain to type. I've heard that the Spotify questionnaire feature is malfunctioning. I'm going to look into that. I don't know why. I'll have to see if I can fix that. But uh, for now, the email always works. Our first question comes from Tanel, he, him. I'm curious about what you think of the similarities between Golden Freddy and Lefty. Like Lefty having a golden eye, being posed like Golden Freddy in the alley, and basically being like the Golden Freddy for the Rockstar animatronics. Do you think that it's just a reference to Golden Freddy, or could hit at there being a more important connection between the puppet and Golden Freddy? It is interesting. I, on the jump, I need to immediately say, I've seen this theory, I don't like it, I don't think there's good evidence for it. Some people speculate that, there, that Golden Freddy was used to create Lefty. I don't think that makes sense. I don't think that's reasonable. They are, they are very different builds. That being said, it is undeniable there's a lot of similarities between Lefty and Golden Freddy. Like you mentioned, the golden, the golden Eye, the role of Lefty within the other Rockstar animatronics, and the pose. So there is a connection being made here, but what is it? I think there is a stronger connection between Fredbear and the puppet than we realize. And I think a perfect example of that we're seeing is in Help Wanted 2. 
Um, in Help Wanted 2, the Fast Force figures and the puppets that we collect throughout the game are the main five animatronics and the puppet. And then in the Fall Fest poster, we see the main FNAF animatronics and the puppet. I think what these games are trying to establish is that the puppet is not a Freddy's invention, but rather the puppet has been around since the beginning. The puppet is a Fredbear's invention. And when they moved over to Freddy's, the puppet carried over, but we already had a, Fred, a Freddy and a Bonnie, so we didn't need a Fredbear and a Spring Bonnie. But I think it's very notable that we're not collecting Spring Bonnie in any of these situations, but we are collecting Fredbear and the puppet. So when it comes to Lefty, do I think there is a connection being drawn between Lefty and Golden Freddy? Yes. Do I think it's saying that they are the same animatronic or that they are similar in role or function? Not really. If anything, I think the intentionality of the comparison might just be that the marionette, or at least Charlotte at that time, has some affection towards Golden Freddy. Like, has some inclination, has some like, oh, I know Fredbear. That's, that's one of the guys. I know Fredbear. I can trust Fredbear. Maybe that's it. I'm not sure. It is really interesting. But I think on the jump, I don't think it's because they're the same animatronic. I think this just might be in conjunction with Help Wanted 2, trying to establish this connection between Fredbear and the puppet. That, that'd be my guess. But it is something we need to look more into. Thank you for your question. Especially with Lefty being uh, essentially carny, like one-to-one. -one. So that, that needs to be looked into. But thank you for your question. Moving on, we have uh, Ayla, she, her. I believe it's Ayla. I apologize. I, I, I look up pronunciations for names before these questions. But sometimes I just get like three different ones. And none of them are like, oh, this is the most common one. So I saw like Ayla... Alia, there's a couple ways to pronounce this. I, I hope it's Ayla. If not, please correct me. Um, do you think there's any significance in Helpy not being in your vision in Help Wanted 2 like he was in Ruin? Of course, it's a surprise that we're wearing the Vanny mask, but after we take it off, do you think there would be anything interesting that could be done with having Helpy appear? Thank you for your question. This is actually something I bring up in this week's video. This week's video is going over all of the timeline lore of Help Wanted 2. Um... It's something I bring up because it's very notable that the staff bots in Fizzy Faz show us that they can swap between normal staff bot and nightmare staff bot instantaneously. To me, this says one thing. The nightmare staff bot design is not physical. It is something we are hallucinating. So why are we hallucinating? I think there is reason to believe that not just Cassie, but Gregory and the Help Wanted 2 protagonist have the chip in their occipital nerve. Cassie puts on the Vanny mask and Helpy appears in the Vanny mask and says, hey, you need a, a chip in your occipital nerve. Bump, done. Now she sees Helpy in her regular vision. There's also other things she sees without wearing the mask, I think, are because of that occipital nerve. I don't think we can fully trust what Cassie sees with her own eyes. A big example of that is the AR stuff. Think about it for a second. Does it make sense that in the physical real world, there's a box that Cassie cannot walk through, but if she puts on an AR mask, suddenly she can walk through that box? It should be the opposite. What I think is happening is the occipital nerve chip is affecting her vision and putting fake objects in her way to make her use the mask more. And so on and so forth. It messes with your vision. So why would the other two have it? Well... The Help Wanted 2 protagonist is already using a Vanny mask when the game starts. Who knows how long he's been using it? If he's a fast technician, there's reason to believe he had been using it for a long time. So, he probably already got the occipital nerve. And then as far as Gregory goes, if GGY is to be believed, he was working for Glitchtrap before Security Breach and likely using a Vanny mask because of that. So, he would have also likely got that occipital nerve chip not to mention if he sees the nightmare staff bots and they're likely a hallucination that's more evidence for that right like he's seeing the nightmare staff bots because he has the occipital nerve chip um so all this to say 
I think the significance that Helpy does not appear in our vision in Help Wanted 2 is less that there's no opportunity for it to happen and more that we do see Helpy when wearing the Vanny mask. We see him in the projector. I think it makes I, I think the Helpy we're seeing in the projector of Help Wanted 2 is the same Helpy we're seeing in Ruin. That is to say, a manifestation of Glitchtrap or the Mimic One program. So that's I, I think we are seeing Helpy, but it's in the projector. Um, but thank you for your question. Our next one comes from Briley, which I like your name because there's one letter off from mine. Uh, but she, they, thank you for your question. Do you think there's any reason why Michael doesn't have an entry in the character encyclopedia? I feel like on one hand, it's strange that the guy who's arguably the main character in almost every game isn't really discussed. But on the other hand, I suppose an entry would confirm too many things for the lore slash timeline. And we know how Scott feels about that. Then again, maybe his omission is evidence all the same. Thank you for your question. It's definitely, a, um, it's one of those things that the moment we saw that, Everyone was like, why the hell isn't Michael in here? I think there's a few reasons. One, like you mentioned, it would have revealed too much. That being said, it, I think it would be more than more than possible to make an entry for Michael and obscure anything that would give too much away. Like in the stat block, mark it classified or something. In the paragraphs, mess with the text and cover some of it. You know what I mean? Like there's ways to present it without giving too much. If I had to guess why Michael isn't in here, one, maybe that would be too much thematically for the rest of the book and it's just not worth it. Two, I wonder if it just comes down to Scott isn't ready to give us a canon design for Michael Afton. Because the only visuals we fully have of Michael Afton is the Rick Astley silhouette, the sprites we see in sister location, and I think that's it. I mean, there is the representation, I guess, in... FNAF 6, if you believe that's what that's supposed to be showing us, but that, that's pretty much it. So if we had an entry here and they didn't want to give too much away, it would have no picture and barely any text. So at that point, why include it? I, I think that's my that's what my gut says, because a canon design would be a huge deal. Bigger, They would be the most important thing from that entire book, genuinely. A canon design for Michael Afton would be the biggest thing to come out of that book. And frankly... I'm glad that Michael Afton's canon design wasn't shown for the first time in that book because it would have been done by Lady Fizzy. Um, so fuck that. Anyway, um, that's my that's my, what my gut says. But uh, thank you for your question. And our final question comes from FNAF World Lover, which makes a lot more sense when you hear the question. He him, thank you for your question. What characters would you like to see in FLAF, Five Laps at Freddy's, that wouldn't be the obvious choices? For example, my character choice is the Paper Pals. Thank you for your question. Um, once again, I'm so excited for Five Laps at Freddy's. It is the thing in FNAF Week I'm legitimately the most excited for. More than Into the Pit, more than a free book, more than the Scott interview, Five Laps at Freddy's demo. I'm so excited for it. Off the beaten path characters is a great question. Because like immediately, when you think of like what characters are going to be in there, main roster, lock in. Probably different eras of the main roster lock in. Springtrap, lock in. You know, like the main characters are locked. What non-expected characters would I want to see in there? We're getting Foxy for sure. If we don't have a Captain Foxy outfit, I will be upset. Because he. if Captain Foxy's in there, it's my main. I'm going with Captain Foxy every time. If he's in there. Yarg Foxy would be even better, but that's a... No way we're getting Yarg Foxy. When I think of off the beaten path characters, my first thoughts go to FNAF World and the books, right? I think it'd be really cool to get some book characters to get more canon designs of them. So, like, I think the Stitch Wraith and Eleanor would be awesome characters for Five Laps at Freddy's, and it would give us some canon visualization of these characters like 3d visualization even if it's in like a chibi or style other characters that i think that i would like to see that are not obvious um i think many of the fnaf world enemies would be fun specifically bounce pot i feel like bounce pot is like kind of the go-to fnaf world reference and i think bounce pot with the little two leaves holding onto the wheel would be really cute so I think that makes a lot of sense too. 
Um, VIP. I mean, he just got announced. He's in a book that's coming out like next week. So I don't know if Click Team was aware of that character, but he's a little pig character. I love little pig characters. Um, mediocre melodies are probably not going to be in there, but if any of them are, I hope Pig Patch, because he is my favorite. Um, but I feel like Mist. Uh, I feel like Mister Hippo is kind of a lock. Um, if if any of the mediocre melodies are in there, Mister Hippo probably the one that's in there because he is like the poster child for mediocre melodies. So that makes sense. I think it'd be really funny if we got Midnight Motorist Sprite Guy. That would be really funny. Um, I feel like William Afton, like FNAF Two pixel art William Afton, kind of a lock. But FNAF. But I wonder if we could get other pixel art characters. You know, that'd be fun. Like we like we got 8-Bit Baby in FNAF AR. If we're getting these characters and we get different eras of them, I think a pixel art era for all of them would also be really fun. And to top off the list, I think the crying child would, would be really funny. Imagine, like, you see his head just peeking up above the wheel and he's actively crying. That'd be very funny. Uh, but th those would be my picks for, like, non-obvious choices. But thank you for your question. Once again, if you want questions answered on the podcast, you can send them to Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, but until next time, thank you for watching Freddy Fazbear Pizza Podcast, where the pizza abilities are endless. We hope to enjoy your future patronage. Bye-bye for now.